Hello and welcome. This is it. Straight 8 2020, the premiere. We're not in Cannes. It's not our 15th um, annual premiere at the Cannes Film Festival, but it's an exciting show we've put together. We've got eight amazing films, the very best from 162 films submitted from all around the world this year, chosen by our jury, Asif Kapadia, Robbie Ryan, Justine Wright, Katie Metcalf, and Joe Duncombe. They're, um, like us, privileged and lucky and excited every year to get to watch the, the, the best of the best and we're seeing them before you are, which is so unfair because you've made them. So we will be unleashing them soon. Um, thank you everyone that's come along now. Um, if you're into uh, independent filmmaking, if you're into the arts, if you've got any kind of a heart and soul, you're gonna really enjoy this. And if you know anyone else like that, now's a good time to get on that second screen and tell them where you are at straight8.net forward slash 2020, watching live uh, this embed from our YouTube. Uh, as we release these these best films of the year uh, into the ether. All of these films were made before the world went wonky. So it's really interesting. I think you'll find watching them, there's a sort of innocence about them. And um, we have another competition called Shootout where companies compete at straight eight rules. And that actually happened where all the films were made after the world went wonky. So it's a big contrast. And if you're interested in that, there's a premiere tomorrow at 2 p.m. UK time of 13 films made in isolation. But let's not talk about isolation. Let's not talk about nasty things. Let's talk about cinematic freedom. With Straight 8, when you enter, and anyone can enter, you make your film about anything. We don't make it easier for you by saying, here's the theme. We make it harder for you. And it's like, what do you want to make your film about? If you could have three minutes, 20 seconds of the big silver screen in Cannes in a 250 seat cinema, what would you put up there? And that's what all these people thought about. And then they got into, how do I do it? Who do I need? Get the family together. I mean the filmmaking family or the actual family and make everything, make the props, make it happen. There's some amazing stuff in here. You're also gonna see some behind the scenes bits, which are gonna show you a little bit about how they're made, which we wouldn't normally have. So the show tonight is a bit different because we can't be in Cannes, but we are equally, if not more excited to share it. The only thing we're a bit sad about is we won't have that kind of feedback with the audience of like 250 people sitting there. So maybe if you're that way inclined while you're watching, if you love a film, just stick some applause on our social media post or something or anywhere. Um, just, just let the filmmakers know how much you're enjoying it. And um, I know you're going to, because it is really, really amazing what's been done this year. Now to really enjoy it, it's really important that you know how bloody hard it is to make a good straight eight film. So I'm now gonna throw to my uh, partner in crime on straight eight, Alex, who's in another shed in another part of the UK and he's about to explain how difficult it is to make a straight eight film. Alex. It's ridiculously difficult. Uh, it's hard to put it into, into words, particularly for people who are used to shooting on a digital camera, having a whole load of takes, going back, cutting it up, making the film you want. That's the exact opposite to how straight eight works. You do all your editing before you start shooting. And then as you shoot, you shoot sequentially with a Super 8 camera which you load up with a cartridge and then every single time you press the trigger, this is an actual cartridge in here, so I'm gonna, whenever you press the trigger, you're adding a shot to your film. So I've just shot the camera. Uh, and that's it. You send off the cartridge, complete but unprocessed. We get it processed. You make a soundtrack without having even seen your film. We simply line up the first frame of the picture with the beginning of the soundtrack and let it play. There's no special effects in post, there's no fancy grade, there's nothing. And you don't even get to see it until for eight people today, uh, for another 20 people two days from now, and for everyone else when you get your film back. You don't see it before then, it's only us, only the jury, whoever see the film. Right, enough talking. It is time to watch these amazing films. Good luck to all the filmmakers, I know you're out there watching. Good luck everyone else. Uh, here we go, it's it's our 15th Cannes Film Festival premiere, right there on your screen. Here we go, hope you enjoy it. Your film is in. Yay! 
Yes! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> So there must be more than these three frames, right? <laughs>this film for two reasons one is i just love how super eight it looks how all the idiosyncrasies and perceived flaws in the in the format are really exploited and just looks beautiful as a narrative piece it just shows how much you can do in a short duration if you strip everything back keep it simple and tell a simple story well really in that sense it's really inspiring film this is very good for me, I must say, because it's, um, I, I love music and I love film and this brings, it's, it's a very personal thing, actually. The one guy I'm dancing with, the one guy I'm, I'm bad with and under the shower and all this is very sick right now. He has a very bad lung disease. It brings us together after 30 years. Let's put it this way. It would be a shame to not see it for real, like on a screen with people. But I said to the guy, uh, Adam, who made the sound, um, that if we got into Canada, I would pay for us all to go. So it's kind of worked out for the best, really.
terrorist attacks bring people together? Like now, if the front car was rigged to blow and we all got stuck down here, would everyone come together in the face of diversity? Or would it be every man, woman, boy, girl, transgender, for him, her, their self? Would everyone fall into predictable character stereotypes like some daft blockbuster? Oh god, I look so fat. Okay, literally. Oh, Bloody hell. Literally. I found my co-star. She's absolutely perfect. Excuse me, sir. There'd be some expendable side characters as well, like maybe some old people and some hoodlum who seems like a bad guy but turns out to be all right, actually. It'd have to be some sort of added peril. Here we go, the family on a day out in the big city. They're having a gay old time, but uh-oh! Dad's got little Susie's inhaler and no one can get through. Ah, uh, yeah, here we go. The Bellin City boy, there's always one. I bet he's called something douchey like Fabian, or Dwight, with an E. He'd risk everyone else to save his own neck. <laughs> Told you, he was a good guy. I'd have to have it out with Dwight. A big dramatic fight scene in the tunnel where he smashes his face off. Oh my god, literally, it's so cute. Then me and Sharice make it up top to flashing lights and four blankets and all that shite. find out for sure. sneaky shot of the behind the scenes there. I think that's probably one of the best Super 8, straight 8 entries I've ever seen actually. I'm really impressed with the animation style as well. That whole cardboard cutout thing is pretty tricky to do. I've tried to do it myself. One of the biggest challenges involved is uh, your own breath when you're breathing heavily and deeply over your little creation, getting stressed out and you sort of like suddenly go <laughs> and your little piece just fucks off and you go, oh, God damn it, like I've just ruined my straight eights. The whole style of the drawings and the shots and the compositions and stuff, um, it's super interesting and um, like the little special effect with the electric going off there, I wonder, I don't even know how they've done that. Was that just like a bit of scribbling or something? London, January 31st, 2020, the last day before Brexit, a cold grey day to kick off a miserable future. I came up here to feel safe, to get above it all, but I'm only delaying the inevitable. Soon enough I'll have to get down there and live in the country they've been promising us for the last three years. Three years and three months of hiding from the consequences of the referendum fiddling with my Super 8 camera while Britain burns. Those scumbags who voted leave, I used to feel sorry for them. Saw them as stupid animals. Until I couldn't walk down the road without being called a fucking Muppet. Told to go back to Sesame Street where I belonged. And the other Remainers? Battening down the hatches and getting ready to blame and complain for the next decade. Trying to reverse time. Screw them. 
Brexit or no Brexit, this whole country's still going down the toilet. Anyway, that was my state of mind, until I realised you can't turn back the tide, just move with it. Try and find some high ground to keep from going under. There's a party in Parliament Square today, Brexiteer Ground Zero. There is nowhere I'd less rather be, but the way forward starts there. I didn't want to join them, just understand them, so I had to go. Half an hour later, I got out of the tube at Westminster, and there they were, singing, flag-waving, looking happy and angry at the same time. They were almost outnumbered by the press. By evening, there were thousands of the bastards. I forced myself to talk to them, catching them in a good mood, trying to find out what made them tick. They told me of freedom, of taking back control, it sounded like the same old deluded shit, until it struck me. This wasn't about Europe. It was about renewal. It wasn't about going back. It was about reaching into the future and letting go of the past. Starting with this fucking Super 8 camera. It's a symbol of the past. It must be destroyed. Take it off life support. It's fucking dead. Stick it in the ground. We're moving forward. Moving into the future, it's not 1973 anymore, Britain's out of the EU, now destroy the memory and smash the obsolete memory machines, powered by analog regret, fuck Super 8, shoot it, stab it, blow it up, burn it, banish it to the past, we're moving forward, we're moving forward to the future, <laughs> There's a little bit of film at the end of this car, so here's me riding my bike. Doot, doot. I really enjoyed moving forward. It's tough to address a current divisive political issue and successfully bring humour into the mix. And the team really pulled that off. The scenes on location, the surprising narrator, the absurd tone, all really worked together to elevate the story. And I was particularly impressed by the team's ability to move the storytelling on in unexpected directions and to take it somewhere dark and hysterical and punk, but still end on a high note that wraps up nicely into an ode to Super 8 as a medium. Well done. The basic theme of it is, is to look to the future, not to the past. In retrospect, of course, the future for him was coronavirus. Who's talking about Brexit anymore? I thought it was going to be like really up to the minute satirical film, but on Super 8. And it turns out to be a bit of a time capsule, really. Because it was all on one roll of film, it felt the same feelings I've had when I've done anything live or there had to be one take. You know, where it's like, oh, yeah, this will be easier because it's one take, but it's always harder and more stressful.
I think one of the things that struck me was just the general pacing of the film is really nicely done. The editing is almost flawless, um, which is incredible for this medium. Uh, the use of shot sizes, shot selection, shot reverse shot, crash zooms, it all works really, really well. And then the humour within the story was just really charming, from the adoring, fussing parents and grandparents um, to the anarchic world that the child creates and all the chaos that goes on. It just looks like um, it was great fun to make and it's really entertaining to watch. I've done a lot of uh, little shorts with kids before in them. That's been kind of my go-to for something like this. It's a little project. It's just it's just a lot of fun. And I think it's one of the things that uh, yeah, we, we like to hear stories and comedies about kids. We made this in northern British Columbia in a place where I don't know if anyone's rolled a roll of Super 8 since, uh, you know, uh, the 60s. The pressure was on because it's all in one roll, but the pressure is also off because whatever we get, we get. So, and that was a really nice, very liberating feeling. And honestly, I can't wait to do it again. You can always prepare well and, you know, you know, think it through, but the ingredients that is very necessary to the shooting of this format is just a lot of luck. And I think we got lucky that day, so <laughs> fingers crossed it just turned out okay. I just watched the film Crumbs, which is made in stop motion, so people move like this. And uh, it had to take at least a month to shoot it because it took me like 16 weeks just to shoot this video of how impressed I am. Thumbs up for Crumbs. I think for the actors, they actually had to, you know, without rehearsal, because we were not rehearsing anything, they had to animate themselves frame by frame 
and being together in some shots they had to predict what's the other actor gonna do next in next frame and actually make the whole thing work. I mean, Chris is so lovely and like, we really wanted to have a chance to just spend some time with him. He told them uh, really to love film and this is our little thank you. <laughs> I'm going to be honest, the camera was quite old and, and we had had technical problems with it before. Um, so I feel confident that if we managed to pull off, what what he was trying to show us or what we we've been taught in the past that it would look good but whether we did <laughs> okay speed we're saying my name's chris i'm a cinematographer and we're gonna shoot speed i'm not sure i am a cinematographer oh okay controversial how would you describe yourself my name's christopher hughes and I was born in West Norwood, and I was adopted into a family, into my normal family. I was only a few days old. The only thing I can say about um, the future is it's not what I expected it to be ever. I'd met James Mackay by chance. He um, explained to me how photography worked, and that was damage done. Thank you, James. I said, no, I do like stills. It's just. I can have 32,000 or something on a royal film. I suppose I knew Derek's art from, I was a child when um, Jubilee and Sebastian came out. And I, I didn't really ever imagine that I'd meet him, but I did, uh, James was producing for Derek. And so we'd visit Derek regularly. We became friends and he knew I liked Monet. So he gave me a book of Monet's that had quite a big influence on me. I particularly liked the very late ones. He's got, uh, Monet's got cataracts by this time. It's finding it difficult to see. And the paintings are just psychedelic. What on earth have you been taking, Monsieur Monet? Well, I like water because it's, the patterns, the reflections are always the same and they're always completely different. You won't get two friends the same ever. Derek took us down to Dungeness. I'd never been there, I didn't even know it existed. And it's this extraordinary place. It was just like shingle as far as the eye could see, a nuclear power station glowing on the horizon. Derek created a garden in somewhere which wouldn't, it wouldn't be obvious that it was a good idea. You know, stones everywhere. So he imported soil and found plants that were particularly well suited to that rather hostile environment. So Derek's garden kind of expands into the landscape. So it's actually truly immense. Derek got AIDS and eventually died from it. You don't die instantaneously with AIDS, and there was no treatment for it, it was very early on. And it wasn't just Derek. A lot of people died, a lot of um, people close to me died. And um, it was um, a, a very difficult time for all of us. But Derek was always outspoken about it, he, he would um, always say, very generous man, tell me anything I wanted to know. But I miss Derek terribly, it was awful. Of course, I, it wasn't all good. The films are very happy memories. I like to think he's there looking over my shoulder if I'm out with a Super 8 camera. So I'm just going to make um, a short in-camera film. And so I'd like to do, just make him a, a postcard to heaven. And I'm going to do things which I've never done before, so it's all, it's an experiment, but yeah, it's just an experiment. You can't really have um, a wrong answer to an experiment, you've just got an answer. <laughs> I think art is there to communicate the things that we can't speak of. I've known about Straight Eight for a really long time. Had the pleasure of meeting Ed many, many years ago. And in fact, when I was a Channel 4 commissioning editor, we did a Straight Eight uh, project for Channel 4. And I personally have done a Straight Eight, so I have a big dose of humility and know exactly how hard they are to do. I thought it was an absolutely beautiful, incredibly intimate uh, and touching portrait. And I also like the kind of metaness of it, that here we are uh, with a straight eight film about a cinematographer who's actually in frame and talking about light and talking about imagery. So many ways it's really simple, but actually it's also a really complex film with so many layers. 
um, and ideas. You know, it's a simple journey of a character telling his own personal story. Through that journey, you learn about relationships, you learn about Derek Jarman, and then you understand how Super 8 is actually a part of the story. Super 8 and Derek Jarman and The Guardian are all linked. Derek often filmed uh, whole films on single role of Super 8. His first major Super 8 film, Studio Bankside, uh, that's edited in camera on uh, two roles of Super 8. I particularly loved the way he said, well, this is an experiment, isn't it? And you can't go wrong with an experiment because it's an experiment. It just shows the power of what can be said in three minutes of Super 8 film. The whole reason why I bought the Super 8 camera in the first place was our wedding back in August of last year. And this is the first time I've used it since the original use that I bought it for. I think it's a really beautiful piece of work. Um, I think in just three minutes it captures something really uh, profound and eventful in a child's life. I found the way it was shot incredibly evocative and emotional. And I think there's something really beautifully fable-like about the way the story is, is structured. It's so simple and yet incredibly profound at the same time. And yeah, I just think it's a really beautiful piece of work so congratulations normally i'm working with you know alexa minis all the way down to black 
magic cameras. It's just whatever the project calls for. But uh, shooting on Super 8 really kind of takes me back to my old film photography days. It's really nice just to take yourself outside of normally what you do and, you know, with teams and, and productions and budgets and all that and just make something for yourself and make something that you think could be really interesting. We we'll hopefully have something on that cartridge, but I mean, if there's um, if it's ex if there's if there's something visible, that that would be amazing, you know. I love Fly Home, it's a great, great story. Um, and it's sort of this great example of the Stray A ethos, which is in-camera editing, which is in this film particularly is flawless. It's so economic, it's so storytelling, you know, centric that, you know, you couldn't make this, you know, nothing was left on the edit room floor, shall we say, even though there is no edit room floor. So fair dues, that's a, a huge achievement. And the story is really good fun. It reminded me of when I was starting out doing Super 8 films of my own, we used to always make a spaceship in a, our bedroom. So it kind of sent back a lot of really lovely memories for me. And the only thing I might do differently is I probably would have killed a fly. But in this day and age, that's probably deemed, you know, flyest. So I, I wouldn't want to do that. We were really worried that, um, that the fly that was attached to a magnet was going to just drop off the paper as it had done in rehearsal after rehearsal. But eventually you just kind of have to 
press the trigger and, and hope to high hell. I've been going to the event at the Real Life Cam Film Festival for a few years now, and I always really enjoy it. It's always uh, an evening where you don't know what to expect, but you come away really touched and really moved actually by um, some films that are kind of just bursting with invention uh, and talent. I'm a big science fiction fan anyway. I love low budget sci-fi. Um, you know, those films where the ideas at play are much more important than the kind of special effects or the visual experience. I love the way that this one uh, reminded me of John Carpenter uh, and Duncan Jones's Moon. And I love the way that the twist in the tale really delivers some pathos to what is a very simply told story. Um, yeah, big thumbs up from me and hats off to the filmmakers. The team is going to be so, so pleased. We spent a lot of time doing that film. So, wow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, that is what Straight 8 is all about. I think you get a good dose of the raw, the rawness. I'm not crying there, but I, I am sort of in a way. It was a brilliant selection this year. Um, well done to everybody who got involved. Massive thank you to CineLab London, our partner since 2016, processing and scanning and doing it with great professional care and attention and also just great to hang out with and a good good bunch of people running an amazing company. Um, thanks also to, to all our jury again. Um, they're fantastic, they love watching the films every year and they're a big part of what we do now, as is everyone that entered. Everyone that entered, not just everyone whose films got shown tonight. We really appreciate it. It's, it's a big community and um, it's open to anyone anywhere. Tell your friends, get involved again, keep doing it, get lucky, get unlucky, learn. Throw caution to the wind, just try stuff out. You know, every one of the jury will tell you that the best way to become a filmmaker is just keep making films, be prepared to make mistakes, experiment, like people said tonight. It's okay to experiment, it's cool. You gotta do it. Uh, I say that because I have to remind myself as well, we've all gotta keep making stuff. Um, films are good to make, so are other things like bat boxes and other things, tree houses, but you know, let's keep it on, on point about film. Um, thank you so much to everyone else who tuned in tonight. This link will remain here. You can send it to your friends, you can watch it again. Um, it was a weird year, we all know that in many ways, but it's been an exciting way to present the films and we've got some learnings here and we like your feedback and maybe we should do it this way more often. It's certainly greener, which is a very important thing right now. So um, a massive thank you again. Get involved at straightech.net. All our social links are on there. You know, if you do that kind of thing, do that kind of thing. And we'll see you maybe in Cannes next year, um, but maybe it won't be Cannes. And, um, Stand by for some interesting announcements soon as we start to think about what next year might look like because we're already doing a lot of thinking. But right now, I think it's time for a well-earned drink. Well done again to all the filmmakers. And if you thought our intro or outro wasn't that good, it's because we did it in one take and we could not be bothered to do it. Not couldn't be bothered to, but we knew if we did it again and again, it would just get worse and worse. So this is as good as we had. It's digital, but in true state, straight eight file, straight eight style, it was single takes. Um, I'm Ed. You met Alex, that was everyone else. Have a brilliant night, day, morning, afternoon, depending where you are in the world, and keep in touch. Thank you, thank you, thank you.